Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer before we get into tonight's word. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Let's stand together as I get on my knees. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be here in the house of the Lord. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man. Lord, a tall man, a short man, a white man, a black man, or a brown man, Father, an old man or young man or a woman for that matter. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus that we ask your Holy Spirit would speak to us, to minister to us, to show us things in the Word today, that it would come alive and, and, and show us and, and, and work in our hearts and in our lives what you have caused and would have us to do, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the blessings that you've given to us, your church. Lord, these blessings that we ask upon ourselves, Lord, we don't ask solely upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Lord, we glorify our brothers and sisters and we magnify and lift them up because we see ourselves as co-laborers in the body of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Baptist and Episcopalian and Methodist and Lutheran and Presbyterian, Charismatic and Pentecostal brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for our uh, churches all around the Inland Empire, for Harvest to Grow, for Sandals, for The Well, the Way World Outreach, Lord, for Ecclesia. Lord, we thank you for Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, Lord, and, and, and Crossroads and, and Abundant Living. And, and, Lord, all the churches all across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters in the Coachella Valley at the Rock, in South Riverside at the Rock, in Temecula Valley at the Rock, and in Coastal Hills, San Diego at the Rock. Lord, we thank you that you would bless our brothers and sisters. And Lord, may to you be the glory, praise, and honor for all that this church accomplished, Lord, and your body all together would accomplish. Lord, may it grow to, go to your praise and glory in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Well, praise God. Being seated, as you're being seated, go ahead and grab your Bibles. I'm, I'm excited for tonight's word. It's one of those things that tonight, there's a title. The title of tonight's message is Going Deeper with God. And if I could say anything tonight, it's really the heart of this message is more along the lines of the confessions of a pastor. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to just be open, I'll be honest with you tonight, and just this is a message that has been something that has been stirring in my heart and, and in my life, and I've been experiencing and going through in my own life. You know, we go through life, all of us, with a desire to grow deeper and to get further in our relationship. When we come into the family of God and we get into this salvation, there's a desire inside of us to grow deeper. Oftentimes, though, you might have experienced this just like I will tell you tonight. So if, if you have experienced this, rest assured you're not alone. That there are times in our lives when it seems like we're pressing forward or we have the desire to grow in our relationship, in our understanding, and in our knowledge to go deeper with God. But at the same time, as we feel like we want this desire, it seems as though our attempts are feeble or they falter and we don't seem to grow or progress like we think we ought to. I could just tell you in my own life that there's been a, a season that I've been going through that I've been desiring and, and wanting to, to press forward and to say, God, listen, you've already brought me to some amazing places in my life, but I don't want to stay here. I want to go further. I want to go farther. I want to go uh, beyond what I could ask, think, or imagine. And so, Lord, I just want to get deeper in my relationship with you. But it seemed in my life and in this season of my life like I was running up against this invisible wall that was hindering me or stopping me from really going to where I wanted to go. Now, you won't often hear this in churches. You won't often hear somebody tell you that they themselves want to go deeper with God, but found themselves in a place where they didn't feel like they were moving or progressing forward. That's not something we should tell you. But we're all, we've all been there before in some form or fashion. And today, I want to share with you what God brought me to, what God took me to as an inspiration and encouragement. And as I was going through this and I was frustrated and I was crying out to God saying, God, listen, there's some things in my life I know that I have got to work on like we all do. I want to go deeper. Where am I? Where is this taking me? Why am I not progressing like I know I should be? And today we're talking about going deeper. And in this and in my prayers and in my, and in my crying out to God, God brought me to the book of Isaiah. So if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah in the 55th chapter. 
Isaiah in the 55th chapter. This is during the time of Israel's exile. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, is an encouragement from God to his people. And in a time of my life, you could even say a wilderness or a, a time of desert, not necessarily a time of growing or of bounty, but rather a time of, of cutting back and trimming, or you could even say it like this, like the Bible, like Jesus, the time of pruning. God brings me here to Isaiah in the 55th chapter. Isaiah in the 55th chapter, verse number 6 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And as I was praying and God brought this to, the, to my attention, I began to ask God, what are you trying to tell me about this? What is it that this verse has that applies to my life and applies to the situation in which we, we find ourselves in in life? Verse number 7 goes on to say, Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now I found some solace and, and comfort in this verse. Because first off, I know, looking at my own life, I said, well, praise God. I know that I'm not wicked. Hallelujah. So right off the bat, you know, you look at somebody or you look at the situation. I've always heard, uh, my mom's always said, you know, don't compare anybody. Don't compare yourself because when you compare, somebody always gets smaller. But, you know, in this, in this case in point, it was nice to kind of look and say, okay, I'm not the smaller of the two. But there was a message in this. There was a comfort in this that the Lord had spoken to me about going deeper in my desire to go forward in, the, in our lives. So what we're going to do tonight, we're going to take a look at these two verses. We're going to take a look and we're going to pull some principles out of these very simple things. Oftentimes it's the simple things that we need to hear the most. Oftentimes it's the things that we know or we have already heard that we need to be reminded about because they're so simple or we hear them so often or we say, oh yeah, yeah, I already know that, that we overlook or we oversee those things and we move beyond them and we, go, we try to overcomplicate things. You know, the thing about the gospel is that, yes, the gospel is complicated. It is. And when you look at some of the things and the promises of God and how God has intertwined things, it can get, I mean, it can blow your mind. But the beautiful thing about the gospel is that it's very simple. It's very simple. There's some very simple, simple concepts that all we have to do is grab a hold of and God will do the rest. So today we're going to look at this verse, these two verses. We're going to look at growing deeper with God. If you've ever found yourself in a place where you've desired to go deeper with God, but didn't seem like it was doing or going or progressing like you thought it should, maybe these today will apply. Maybe it is that right now you're in a time of growing in your relationship with God. These will still apply to your life and they will only benefit you if you grab a hold of these concepts, if you grab a hold of these three simple thoughts that we're going to talk about tonight and apply them to your life. You know, in the Word of God, there are two people particularly that I myself can relate to. Two people in the Bible, or two characters in the Bible, aside from Jesus, obviously, that I could say are, are heroes to me. And that is because they have tremendous highs in life and they have tremendous lows in life. These two people are Peter and David. Oftentimes you'll hear that from me because I'll talk a lot about Peter and David. Why? Because both of them were zealous individuals. Both of them were hot-headed individuals. Both of them had tremendous testimonies for what God did in their life. But the beautiful thing is, is both of them had tremendous low points in their life in which God brought them from the low to the high. And it's such an encouragement to me because oftentimes there are, there, are, there are times in my life, I don't know if anybody else ever felt like this, but they've got foot in mouth syndrome where it seems like no matter how many times or no matter how small or big I seem to open my mouth, my foot just has a way of going right into it. I love that because Peter and David are two that are oftentimes that, that seem like they had, it's like you just couldn't imagine the things that they went through, but yet God used them in such a mighty way which gives hope for people like myself, who have foot and mouth syndrome, who are zealous individuals that oftentimes make the wrong decisions, but yet God has a future in store for us. So today, we're not going to look at both Peter and David. I just wanted to tell you that just for your own knowledge, but we will look at David. We're going to take Isaiah. We're going to look at the example of David. 
We're going to look at the example of Jesus, and we're going to apply that to our lives today. So here is what we're... I'm going to take you through history all at the same time. I'm, this, is, this is nuts, okay? David, hundreds of years before the exile, uh, then the exile, then you've got Isaiah, then you've got Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus, now you've got Jesus, now here we are thousands of years after Jesus. We're going to talk about all four things all at the same time working together. Because the gospel is incredibly simple, but incredibly complex. So today we're going to talk about growing deeper in our relationship with God. Growing deeper with God. Growing deeper with God. Looking at this example out of Isaiah. Looking at the life of David and the writings and the sayings of David. You see the Bible says that David was, was called a man after God's own heart. Now I love this, that God told Samuel that he was searching or he was looking, seeking for a man after his own heart. You know that God didn't have to go through one person at a time. Are you a man after my own heart? No. Are you? No. Are you? God knew already who was after his heart. That word searching or seeking is God was desiring to find a man after his own heart. A man who wanted to go after the things of God. And the Bible refers to David, who was a murderer. An adulterer, a sinner, like any other sinner, but yet was considered to be a man after God's own heart. And David, through his highs and his lows, found ways and shows us ways to go deeper with God. Because if there's somebody who had a deep relationship with God, David was that man who wrote the Psalms that encourage us, who, who had the exploits that set Israel in motion to bring Jesus Christ and to build the temple and to establish the covenant of God with the people, David was this man. So today, looking at growing deeper with God, three very simple, easy things for us to grab a hold of tonight. Number one, in growing deeper with God, to utilize every moment. Utilize every moment. You know, speaking from experience, I remember long ago I had learned that a life of prayer brings fulfillment and blessing. I had heard once long ago that uh, somebody had said, you know, I don't say amen at the end of all my prayers because that's like hanging up the phone. So when I talk to God, I talk to God, and at the end of the day, hey, I'm going to go to bed, I'll say amen there because I want to keep my line of communication open with God all the time. And I developed this lifestyle in my own life and in my own heart of, of, of continual prayer. Now, my prayers may not be complex. I don't want you to think, oh, well, how am I supposed to do this? My prayers would simply be there would be a time maybe in the car where the song I was listening to was just driving me nuts. I'd turn off the radio and in the silence, just start to pray in my spirit. Just start to speak to God. Just look over at something and say, wow, God, look, thank you for letting me be here today. Lord, thank you for my life. Thank you for the sunset that I see today and to have a continual line of communication with God. My prayers might be long, they might be short, but they were continually ongoing. There was a time in this season or this, uh, this pressing forward with God that I began to notice that I was weaning from this mentality of prayer or this life of prayer. In these times of when I knew that I should be spending time searching the things of God, but rather my flesh would take over and I would spend more time watching that darn thing in our living room called the television. There would be times when I knew I should go open my Bible, but instead of walking over to my Bible, I would take a detour in my house and stand in front of that darned iron box in the kitchen called the refrigerator. And what would happen is, is, what was happening in my life is I noticed that I was reducing the time that I was giving to God. And in reducing the time that I was giving to God, I was finding in my own life in this season, this was hindering my forward progress with what God wanted me to do. The Bible says... In Isaiah 55th chapter, verse number 6, we'll put it back up there. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. I understand we live busy lives. Am I telling you that you have to spend every waking moment in prayer or every waking moment in the Bible? Listen, God says that if you don't work, you don't eat. The Bible says that a man who doesn't take care of his house is worse than an infidel. So God clearly expects us to spend time in this life at work, 
doing things, being busy. God's not surprised by our busy lives. But what God does desire is our time. God wants those seconds, those moments. It might be a minute. It might be just a few seconds. But the Bible says to seek the Lord while he is near. Seek God while he may be found. Why? Because have you ever spent the day wasting it away and then you look back at that day and you say, my goodness, I wasted the whole day. Has anybody ever done that, slept in, maybe got out of bed at like 4 o'clock in the afternoon and it was already getting dark and you said, well, I might as well just go back to bed. <laughs> what a waste of a day. And you know that when you think about it, you look at that day and you say, man, I can't get that time back. I can't get that time back. The most valuable commodity on earth is time. It's not money. It's time. Why? Because it's not a replenishable resource. We have such a short time here on earth. And God says to seek him while he can be found. Call upon him while he was near. God wants us to utilize every moment that we have towards God. If you've got a free time, maybe it's while you're on your drive, maybe it's then, instead of turning on the radio, maybe it is time to turn off the radio and pray, or to listen. Maybe it's time to turn off the television for an extra 30 minutes and seek after God while he's found. You see, we give that television some of our attention, hours of our attention, God's simply saying, I want some of that. We give our hobbies, our interests, the things that we desire, time, motivation, effort, and God says, I simply want some of that. And we have to allow ourselves time and make it a point to give to God time while it is time. Have you ever, you ever thought about it? Have you ever said, oh, you know, I'm going to pick up my Bible. I'm going to read my Bible today. Something happens. Oh, somebody calls, or the kids start crying, or you got to make breakfast, then you got to go to work, then you come home, got to help with the homework. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in there with you, God. And all of a sudden, you look at the, you look at the clock, and you're laying in bed. Okay, I'm going to read my Bible in bed. Praise God. I'm gonna, the last thing I see in the, in the, in the nighttime or the daytime is going to be the Word of God. You crack open the Bible, and all of a sudden, you, you're gone. I'm sure that many of us have been in that position before. Oh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to get down on my... <laughs> Utilize our time. It may just be moments. It may just be seconds. But when we make the priority to give God time in our lives, God says, listen, seek me while I'm here. God's here. He wants your attention. He wants our lives. I said I would look at David if you've got your Bibles. Put a ribbon if you want, or we'll put Isaiah back up there. You've already been there. You go with me to the book of Psalm in the 63rd chapter. Now, for the young adults who, who attend shift, they know, because this is a verse that I just I will hammer them about. Psalms in the 63rd chapter is clearly one of my favorite verses or favorite sections of Scripture because there's a passion in this that I long for in my own life. This is David as he's in the, in the wilderness of Judea, as he's running and hiding for his life. Here's what David cries out to God. Psalms in the 63rd chapter, David says, Oh God, you are my God. Listen to these descriptive words that David gives us. Early I will seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs. For you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live, utilizing every moment. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul will be satisfied with marrow and fatness and my mouth will praise with you with joyful lips. Verse number six, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watch. Here David says, early in the morning I seek you. I thirst for you. I long for you. There's, it's like a, a thirst that just cannot be quenched. Have you ever had, oh, I'm afraid to ask this question because I'm asking it in the innocent and pure way, but have you ever had cotton mouth? <laughs> Some of you chuckled because you know why you had cotton mouth. But I'm just talking about when you're thirsty. You ever just wanted water, just needed something to drink? You try to drink a soda or you try to drink an iced tea, but no, you just need something to refresh you. 
The unquenchable thirst. And here David says, Lord, I seek you in the morning. During the daytime, it's like an unquenchable thirst. I have to keep going back and going back and going back. And then when it gets nighttime, I remember you and I meditate on you then too. Here the psalmist is saying, in this time of trouble in his life, in this time of wilderness, when literally he was in the wilderness, David is saying, God, I just want more time. I want to give you the time. I am dedicating the time in my life to seeking after you. To seeking after you. Jesus tells us, his followers in Luke, the 11th chapter, ask and it will be given. Seek, you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. He who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus tells us people simply to ask, seek, and knock, but you and I have got to put the time in to asking. We've got to put the time in to seeking. We've got to put the time in to knocking. We can't just expect the answer. We can't just expect the result. God says, I want you to spend time asking. Spend time searching. Spend time knocking and finding out my will, and you'll get it. So we wonder sometimes in our lives, why is it that we're not progressing? Why is it maybe it's that we're giving our time to things in our lives that should be given to God? Maybe it's that we're not taking enough time in our lives or just taking that simple moment to say thank you. That simple moment to remain grateful for what God has given to us and apply that to our lives. We're talking about going deeper with God. Going deeper with God. Number two, we have got to put God above all else. When I say utilizing the time, I speak to the efforts of when we give God our time. Now I speak to what we give God. Not just when, but what. Because God's not just after our time. God's after our lives, our hearts, our wills, our desires, our very being. God is desiring you and I. We have got to give, got to make time for God to give the moments, but we've got to give God our lives. You see, this week, the Cobra slash Roth family, we went on vacation. We all went together. I mean, it was chaos. It was like, I don't even know how to explain it. I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, you get, what, three of your kids, three of Kim's kids, that's six, two of my kids, that's eight, Eight babies, six adults, all in one condominium, one, and I'm not, not everybody in their own hotel room, one, you know, and you know kids, they don't, they don't walk, right? Kids run, no matter what, they run. They don't, they don't whisper, they don't know what whisper means, they yell, all right? So, I mean, it was just chaos, but it was, it was a beautiful disaster, it was. <laughs> and of course... In that there's the family fights and there's the arguments and the, the hashing out, but then there's the hugging and the, the loving and the family and we all come together and we leave united. But in this, we went to this special place to me. This, this, this place that we went to up in the mountains is, is very special to me. It's, 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 I can't describe it. I can't explain it. My dad took me there as a kid. I think there's just something inside of me when I get into this area. It's, just, it's like going home. So this is a special place to me. So the fact that we as a family chose to go here on a vacation just meant that I was just going out of my mind. And so what happened is, is I was taking some time. The first morning I would get up, and, I, and, and because of, of, of the family, I didn't want to spend my time and everybody else's time doing everything that I wanted to do. So I thought, you know what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up early in the morning before everybody's awake, and I'm going to go do what I want to do, and I'll be back by breakfast. No big deal. First time I went out, great, wonderful, had a wonderful time. Saw the sunrise. I was praying to God, oh, look how beautiful this is. Second day did it. Third day did it. Fourth day did it. Fifth day did it. Sixth day did it. Seventh day did it. And each day as I did it, I was seeking after my own personal desire rather than taking that early time, which I should have given to God in prayer or in insight. And I was taking this time for my own ambition. And each time I was taking it, I was going out to this escape or this hobby or this thing that I love to do most, I was spending time. And each day as I did it and I neglected to give God the time, I found myself enjoying it less and less until the seventh day I went out before the sunrise. I looked at the sunrise. Why the heck am I out here? This is dumb. Why am I doing this? This is such a waste of time. I should just be in bed sleeping. This is ridiculous. I'm not going to get anything out of this. And I started griping and complaining and grumbling and saying words that I haven't said in a long time in my head. In my head. (laughs) 
The fact is, is what had happened, and you say, well, Pastor, look, it's simply just a vacation. There's nothing wrong with getting away. True, we need to. God commanded a Sabbath rest. But the essence is, is to not get away from God when we get away. Yeah. And see, what had happened is, is that I had taken the time that I would normally take to give to God that moment, that special moment. Didn't have to be a long time. The family, while I was gone, was the doing devotions, but I was gone doing my thing. And what had happened is I had taken my priority. The things which I had liked, and I had taken God, and for that short amount of time, I had elevated these above my priority with God. And for this small week, just a week, for this small week, I began to see something in which I have loved to do for years become something that I could not stand with, to the point I came back and said, I am taking a vacation from my hobby. Because I had taken it and put it in a high place where God was in my life, just for a simple week. But that's the truth, is it just takes a few days of us elevating our selfish desires, elevating our own ambitions, elevating our own wants and thoughts and will above God for us to begin to see that our fulfillment doesn't come from entertainment. Our fulfillment doesn't come from time spent doing what we want to do, but rather our fulfillment in life comes from leaving God in the high places. Giving to God a consecration or a sacrifice of our life. God's not just after our time. He's after our lives. Look what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah, the 55th chapter. Now verse number 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. Okay, I said some bad words, but they're not that bad. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. I said them in my head. Let him return to the Lord. Isaiah, in this, in, this, in this exhortation to the people while they're in the wilderness, while they're in the ex, ex, uh, ex, exile, Isaiah, the, through, the, through the inspiration of God, says to the people, listen, put God back in the high places in your life. Put God back at top of priority in your life. Put God above your will, your wants, your desires in your life, and you will see fulfillment. This is an encouragement to the people to say, listen, you may make some bad choices. You may make some wrong decisions. But put God at the priority and at the center of your life and see the fulfillment and the desires of God operate in your life. We want to grow deeper with God, but if we don't put God at the top, we'll never go anywhere in our relationship with God because God wants to be at the top. At the center. God is good. Looking at David. David had opportunities to do things his way, to do things God's way. We saw this right off the bat. David goes and sees that tall guy taunting Israel. Remember that big tall guy, Goliath? Does it God's way. Picks up some rocks. Speaks the word of God, says, this, who's, this, who's this man to defile the armies of the living God? Does it God's way? Comes at it with faith, knows that God's going to back him, throws a rock, hits Goliath in the head, story's over. David had opportunities to do things his way. David had opportunity to do things God's way. Look at Uriah and Bathsheba. At a time when kings, the Bible says, should be at war, David was at home vacationing. Saw something he shouldn't have saw, ended up falling into adultery, and ultimately leading towards murder. So David is a man of credible ups and downs. Let's look at an opportunity where David had to do it his way or God's way, but he did it his way. 1 Samuel. We're in Psalms, so just turn a couple pages over to the book of 1 Samuel. Really interesting story, amazing story. I mean, just if I could have been a fly on the wall on this one, I would have just loved to have been a fly on the wall right here. 1 Samuel, 24th chapter. 1 Samuel, 24th chapter. Talk about wanting to be a fly on the wall. Saul gets wind that David's in the wilderness, takes an army of 3,000 men to hunt David. Saul comes and he has to do his humanly duty. All right, I don't want to say it. You know, this, we're cobras. Uh, Pastor Jim, it's not a Pastor Jim message unless he references the bathroom once. So Saul had to go to the bathroom. All right. Saul finds a cave, goes to the cave to do his duty. Now, it just so happens in this very cave 
is David hiding from Saul in the darkness with all of his mighty men. Hundreds of guys hiding in this cave, and here Saul walks into the cave to do his duty. All right, now the, 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 the men of David say to David, God has delivered you, Saul, to you, Saul. Look what it says. 1 Samuel 24, verse number 3. So he came to the sheepfolds of the road where there was a cave. Saul went in to attend to his needs. I love how the Bible so gracefully puts it. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now see, David's men said, listen, God said you're going to be the king of Israel. Here's Saul in a vulnerable position, unarmed, unaware, go up behind him, finish the job, let's go home, take the throne, let's have dinner tonight as kings. It would be logical to you and I to say, well, you know, clearly, this, this sounds like a good opportunity. But you see, God had spoken to David. God had imparted to David the respect for the authority, the respect for the anointing as king. And even though David had been anointed as king, David knew that while Saul lived, that Saul was king and that it was God's job to bring David to kingdom or to, to, to bring David to be the king, not David's job. So, so David rose and cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward, look at this, now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's rope. David was so troubled because he had done things his way and by cutting the mere corner off the robe of the man who was trying to kill him. David's heart was troubled because he had cut Saul's robe and he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went his way. And the story goes on to tell us that David came out and showed Saul the corner of his robe and said, listen, I had you in my hands, but I will never harm you. I won't do anything. Listen, I am your servant. You know, and Saul comes back and says, you are favored of the Lord. David found favor in God because he listened to the heart of God. God said, no, this is not the time for you to be king. Your time will come. I will deal with Saul, not you. We have opportunity in our lives to follow our own wills, our own ways, our own desires. But maybe like the Bible says in Isaiah, the 55th chapter, verse number 8, which we don't have, God says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So it's our decision whether or not we're going to give to God our lives as a consecration, as a sacrifice to say, God, listen, these are the things that I want to do, much like David said, man, I'm ready to give this guy the edge of my blade. But no, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. You deal with the situation. Looking at Jesus, the example of uh, uh, thousands of years later and, uh, later and Jesus gives us the ultimate prayer the ultimate example as he goes to the cross and before he goes to the cross as he prays in the garden and he says Father not my what will but yours be done God's desire for us is our lives our hearts not just our time Jeremiah 29 verse number 13 says and you seek me you will find me when you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me. When you search for me. When you search for me. How? With all of your heart. God wants our hearts. God wants our lives. We want to grow deeper in our relationship with God. We want to go further in our understanding of God. God says, I want you to search for me, to seek after me, to desire to know me with all of your heart, with all of your life. And in that we find we find fulfillment in our lives. Are you with me tonight? One last thought, and we'll finish with this last thought. One last thought, going deeper with God. Number three, we have got to let go of the past. Let it go. Whether it was an hour ago, a day ago, a week ago, a month ago, years ago, decades ago, eons ago. The Bible tells us that our sins were as scarlet, but the blood of Jesus washes us white as snow. You see, God does not hold on to our past 
but we do. We convict ourselves of the decisions we've made. We hinder our own progress because of our inability to let it go. We've got to let go of all those hurts. Place our faith and our lives in God's hand. The Bible tells us to cast our cares on who? He who cares. How do we do that? By submitting to God. Allowing him to be in control. To letting the past go. Isaiah, the 55th chapter, verse number 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, the second half. And he will have mercy. God will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We have all, listen, listen, listen. We have all said things we should not have said. We have all done things we should not have done. We have all made stupid decisions. Can I say that? Is that all right? Are you you okay with me? We have all made stupid decisions in life. The Bible even tells us that all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. But did you know something? God already knows that. God's not surprised by the fact that we make dumb decisions. From the very first creation he ever made. Adam and Eve. They started making dumb decisions when they made decisions on their own. Now we have millennia of human nature. God's not surprised by our dumb decisions. That's why the Bible tells us that we are like sheep. You ever seen sheep? There's a video that's on YouTube. It was on America's Funniest Home Videos. There's all these sheep running down a hallway. You ever seen that one? And that one sheep jumps and he hits like a fence post and just falls. I mean, sheep are as dumb as dumb gets. And the Bible calls us sheep. Sheep. Why? Because God knows we're going to make dumb decisions. God knows that. God's not holding on to our past. We're holding on to our past. Why? Because the Bible tells us that the grace of God God's unmerited favor, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf and we can't do it, covers our sins. Now we go before God, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of unrighteousness and forgive us of our sins. So clearly God doesn't hold on to our sins, yet we do. Our hurts, our pains, our aches, the betrayals of life. We've got to learn to let the past go and move forward in life. You see, David was a man of many mistakes. David was a man of some humdingers. He made some whoppers. He was a man of hurt and betrayal. His own son betrayed him. David had a lot to get over. The thing about David that made him a man after God's own heart is that if he made a mistake, he moved forward from that mistake and didn't repeat his mistake. The thing about David is that even after his own son betrayed him, when he heard of his son's demise, his heart was broken because it even doesn't matter what the betrayal was, he was still his son and David had to move forward in life. If we want to grow in our relationship, if we want to get deeper with God, we have got to learn as people to stop being like elephants, but rather be people of God and let the past go. Because you see, elephants never forget. Let the past go and move forward towards God, looking, the Bible says, to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. David, a man of hurts and betrayals, David makes a mistake. He sleeps with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, commits adultery. She gets pregnant. David sets up the murder of Uriah. Uriah's dead. Now David marries Bathsheba. The prophet Nathan comes to David and says that there's a man who has one sheep who loves his sheep, lets the sheep sleep in his bed at night. And then there's another guy that has thousands of sheep on many hills. And the one guy who has thousands of sheep comes to the man who has the one sheep and says, I'm going to eat your sheep for dinner. David jumps up, that man ought to die. And Nathan says, that man was you. Calls David out on his sin. David falls before his face on the Lord, to the Lord, repents of his sin right there. God says, okay, I'm not going to kill you, but your son, your baby, is not going to make it. The Bible goes on to say that the Lord struck the baby. Seven days David was on his face before God. Didn't eat, didn't sleep, fasted and reasoned and, and, and pleaded with God for the life of this child. 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter, verse number 21, the child dies. Now the servants are afraid to tell David because he hasn't eaten. He hasn't slept. He's on his face before God pleading for the life of this child. And they are afraid to tell David, but David hears them whispering, gets up and says, is the child dead? And they say, yes, he is. 
And David gets up, goes, and he washes himself and cleans himself up after not having bathed or, or slept for seven days. And he goes and sits down at his house and says, I'd like to eat. And his servants come to him now, talking about leaving the past behind. Verse number 21, his servants said to him, what is it that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for her. I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Why should I fast? I can't bring him back. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. David experienced something that no parent on earth ever wants to experience. But unfortunately, some have. The loss of a child. The most heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching feeling that any parent could ever go through. The loss of one of their children. And here David, after the loss of his child, one of the worst situations in a person's life, rises up and says, what can I do about it? These are the consequences of my action. I know that the, bite, the baby won't come to me, but I know that there will be a time when I will go to him. That there will be a time when I see it again and see what David has done and the worst and most difficult situation in life. You think that somebody saying bad things about you is hard. Look at what David went through. You think about making the bad decisions. Look at this is the consequence of David's sin. But yet David says, I will move forward. And it goes on to say that he comforted his wife Bathsheba. And from that experience came his son Solomon, who did what David could not do, who took the kingdom where David could not king take it, and God had fulfilled the promises of, of David that the temple of God would be built, and now David sees his lineage and his kingdom go further than he could ever ask or think, because God was faithful. It may be hard. It may be tough. You may have pains. You may have hurts. You may have done horrible things in life, but if we move forward from those and leave the past where it should belong in the past and look to Jesus Christ, now we can grow in our relationship deeper with God than we could have ever asked, thought, or imagined. The Bible tells us that God is faithful to work things out. Romans the 8th chapter, verse number 28. Now we know all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together. Why? Because like Hebrews told us, that we look to Jesus Christ, the author and the most important part, the finisher. Hey, we're in a race. You may stumble. You may have aches or cramps in life from hurts and pains. But in this race, you keep your eyes forward, not behind you, looking to Jesus, the finisher of our faith, who on that cross washed our sins white as snow. And now we can rest assured that when we keep our eyes forward, let go of the past, don't repeat our mistakes like David and learn from those who have gone before us, but look to Jesus, look to God and say, God, yes, I messed up. God, yes, I've said things that I shouldn't have said. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I've hurt people that I shouldn't have hurt. But you know what? Today is a new day and I'm going to go forward for you. I'm going to look to Jesus Christ and I'm going to get forward in my relationship. That's when we begin to grow in our walks with God. And now all of a sudden when the Bible says that God is working out things on our behalf, now we understand that when we keep our eyes fixed on God, we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And we go forward. And now, like the song we sang today, now we can see it and, and, and live it in our lives that we have become a new creation. A new creation. Today, three simple things. Three simple things to grow deeper in your relationship with God. Whether or not you're in a great season of growth, or whether, you're not, whether or not you're trying to figure out why you're not growing the way you should. Three simple things. Number one is to utilize your time. Don't waste the day away. Don't, don't wait another minute. If there's something on your heart to pray about it, stop and pray about it then. If there's something that you see that you need to appreciate God for, appreciate God for it right then and there. Don't wait because you're going to forget. Number two, go ahead and pop number two because I forgot the verbiage. Put God above all else. Make God the center of your life. The, the, the top. Don't put something up. Don't remove God from the high place and put yourself or your ambitions in those high places because you know what's going to happen? Your wants, your desires, like my little hobby, they're going to not fulfill you like they did and then you're not going to like them anymore. Don't waste your time doing that kind of stuff. Put God first and watch everything else fall into place. Number three, let go of the past. Let it go. Let it go. Don't hold on to it. Let it go. Before we go any further tonight, I want to do this. 
If you're, in walk, if you're in your life right now and you're finding yourself in a position where you want to know God more, you want to get deeper with God, you want to go further in your relationship with God, maybe you feel like you're up against the wall. Here's what I want to do. I'm just going to ask if that's you in this place, and hey, listen, I'm already standing, so I'm going to stand, but if that's you in this place, I want you to stand. Let's make this statement today together. Let's, I'm going to pray, and if that's you and you want to go deeper, maybe you're up against a wall right now. You're trying to figure it out. Let's make today, this Wednesday night, the day where we leave the past behind, where we begin to com- or not compromise our time, but rather give God every moment that we can. When we make God the priority of our lives, let's go forward in our walks with God. As a church, let's touch and reach this community like we've never reached before. As a people, Let's touch those around us for the glory of God like we've never before. As Christians, representatives of Jesus Christ, let us shine the light and the glory of God like we've never before because we're growing and getting deeper in our relationship with God. Would you raise your hands to the Lord tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the saints of God. Lord, here we are, your people. God, some of us in this place are hurting are broken. Some of us are in a good position with you. But Lord, regardless of where we are in life, Lord, regardless of where we walk and where we stand and what's going on around us from the left to the right, God, regardless of what's going on in our family, Lord, we want more of you. So Father, we repent of our sins, Lord. We repent of our, 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 our removing you from priorities in our lives, Lord. Help us to look into our own lives and examine, like the word says, examine our hearts, examine our lives. That we would see the time that we waste not giving you the glory, not communicating with you, not communing and and spending time knowing you. Lord, may we look to our lives and realize that you, above all else, are the priorities of our life. And Lord, as we seek after you, like Jesus said, may we find. Lord, as we ask, Lord, would you answer? Lord, as we knock, would you open the doors in our lives? And God, for those of us who are dealing with things and decisions and hurts and pains of our lives that have come in the past, whether they have been just today or, Lord, years and years and years ago, Father, we thank you that you are a God whose mercies are new every day. And, Lord, we ask right now that you would remove the guilt and anguish of our own lives because we know that you have washed our sins white as snow. But, Lord, we have got to learn to cast our cares upon you. The Bible says that we submit ourselves Humble ourselves to you, God, and cast our cares, Lord, by allowing you to be in control. So, Father, right now, through faith, through confession, we believe, God, that you are in control, and we surrender our lives. God, we surrender our lives. Lord, we surrender our lives to you. Use us. Use your people, Father. Draw us closer to you. When we draw close to you, Lord, may we utilize every moment, and Lord, may you utilize every moment back and speak to us like we've never been spoken to. Touch us like we've never been touched. Lord, may your presence engulf our lives wherever we go that we would shine the glory of God for all to see. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor as we live our lives for the purpose that you have brought us here for, to shine and to spread the glory of God for those who are lost and are broken. And Lord, we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Let's just give God the praise in this place that he's worthy of. Hallelujah. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Before we go any further tonight, there are those of you that are in this place tonight. You've been striving to push forward. You've been thinking about this. You've been, something's been on your heart. The Spirit of God's on this place. Let's not go any further than today. If you're in this place today and you need to give God your heart, you need to give God your life. Right now is your time. Let's not play games. Let's not beat around the bush. If someone was to ask you how you get to heaven and you say, I think or I hope, I wish I'm going to get there. Listen, right there off the bat, you know you're not going to get there because if you knew it, you wouldn't have to say, I wish, I think, I hope. You can't make it because of your goodness, because of your good deeds, only because of the grace of God, because of the goodness of God by faith, the Bible says. The moment of your salvation is right now. Let's not go any further in tonight's night than right now. 
If that's you in this place, here's what I want you to do. You've been talking about it. You've been thinking about it. The Spirit of God's on you right now. The Bible says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. The Spirit of God's on you right now. And if that's you in this place, I need you to get bold. I need you to be brave. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to get out of your chair and meet me right up here at the altar. And let's get right with God together. Let's make this the day of your salvation. Come on. If that's you, you can come. Today is your day. Today is your day. Right now is your time. Don't go another minute forward. This is your time. And you need to give God your heart. You need to give God your life. Come on, if that's you, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. You can come forward if that's you in this place. You're saying to yourself, man, I wonder if I should. You should. You need to get out of your seat. And let's make this the day of your salvation. Come on. If that's you, you can come. You come. Don't wait another minute. Don't wait another minute. Come on. Come on, if that's you from the front to the back, wherever you're at, I know that there's more of you in this place. Come on. Come on, if that's you, you can come. You can come. Come on. Where are you at in this place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. This is your moment. This is your moment. You know it. Come on. This is your time. That's you in this place. Come on. I know that there's more. The Spirit of God's on you right now. Oh, the Spirit of God is on you right now. And you're saying, man, I want to go. I want to go. Come on. If that's you in this place, we're here for you. The Spirit of God, there is no better time than right now. Come on. We'll wait. That's you. Come on. Get out of your chair. Get out of your seat. We'll wait. We'll wait. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, all over this place. Come on. This is your time. Come on. There's a cloud of glory in this place. There's a cloud of glory for God. He's in this place. You feel it. That's why you're here. It's not because it's not because it's song. It's God. That's you in this place. Oh, God, I hear you. I hear you crying out to God. I hear you. If you only knew what today's message is about. Oh, that's you. I know you're in here. God's presence is in this place, longing for you to come and give him your heart. Don't go another day. Don't go another moment without the goodness of God in your life. Come on. We will wait for you. I know you. I feel you. If that's you in this place, come on. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. It's the best decision you'll ever make. I'm not trying to convince you. Let God do that. We're here for you today. If that's you, come on. I know, you're, I know there's someone else in here. You're wondering. You're saying, oh, I don't want to go now. Come on. It's your time. It's your time today. If that's you, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Let's change destinies right now and pray together. If that's you, come on. The Spirit of God's in this place. The Spirit of God's in this place. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Jesus, Jesus, yes, come on. Thank you, Lord. There you are. Jesus, Jesus. Come on. There's no better. There's no better time than now. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Come on. Jesus. A name above names. Thank you, Father. Oh, there's nothing like it. Oh, praise God. Listen, you guys, today is a new day. It wasn't the music, okay? It's not about a band. They're good, but it's not about a band. It's not about a man or anything like that. It was God that brought you here right now. Amen. And when you're in the presence of God, when you're in the hands of God, nothing can pull you away. It doesn't matter what the world brings at you. It doesn't matter what the devil tries to throw at you. 
you are God's. And today is the first day of the rest of your life with God. Let's pray together. Why don't we all say this together? Just repeat this prayer after me. You guys, we're going to pray a prayer. Then we're going to, we'll wait for you guys. You can come on down. We're going to pray a prayer together. And I want you to just say this with all of your heart. It's not about an abracadabra, magical saying, but it's rather, it's about your heart reaching up to God. And all the church, why don't you join in and let's say this prayer together. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come to you today. I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son. He died on a cross and rose again, carrying my sins and my burdens away. Today, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I, I, I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe with my heart that He is God and that I am free. Leaving hell behind. Looking forward to a new life with you. Jesus, I am yours. Leaving hell behind. Going forward with you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Woo! So good. You guys just did something. It will change your life forever. I promise you. We want to help you with something. We're not gonna. We're not gonna leave you out. We're gonna have the service. We're gonna. We're all gonna be here. But we're gonna. I want to take a couple of minutes. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you right over here, waving at you. This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is gonna take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. We already prayed. He's gonna help you with some stuff. He's gonna give you some free literature. He's gonna pray with you just for whatever's going on in your life. And he's gonna have some friends. We're gonna give a friend away to you here at the church called a spiritual personal trainer. Somebody that will come alongside of you when you come to church. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God so that you stay strong and you get strong in the ways of God so that nothing pulls you away and that you go forward like the song said and God makes all things new. So if you would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. <laughs> Woo! Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.